I'll start with um, the first poem, which is called North Facing. And this poem's a little bit of an ars poetica, so a, a poem that talks about what um, poetry means for me and how it functions for me. Um, and recently, I've been quite enamoured with a book called, um, some of you may know it, um, The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bachelard. And um, he envisages, um, what a quote from that book is, inhabited space transcends geographical space. And I think a lot about that and the way really our sense of space, and I think we've heard it here today with other poets, with Bob, with Devon, with Sarah, that, um, you know, uh, as poets particularly, we live, we live um, a lot in our mind and our sense of space is as much imaginary um, as, you know, in inverted commas, real. So um, when I think about poetry for me, I think about poetry as a house, uh, the house of the mind, really, and poetry is a that funny little room somewhere at the top of some rickety stairs where all the dark stuff goes. So that's a that's little bit what this poem um, is about, North Facing. This house has too many windows. Anyone can see in. It's one of those houses people stroll through the back door. They feel free. This house was not chosen by me, but by my husband and father, who pronounced it to be a fine, solid, master-built house, built by masters who morph into monsters. It opens benignly to the morning sun, turning in the right direction. I'm told I should be grateful I am not, which makes me... This house has two stories two stories. The downstairs unrolling like a fiery tongue, I was always afraid to be pushed down. But now that the opening is closing, touch wood, I've begun to write over the holy hole we punched in the door of hell. They say suffering is good for you. I can't tell. This is not my home. I don't live here. I abide in the safe house my mind has constructed from word wood. Only I can enter the back door. Others must knock. If I choose not to be home, I'm not. But here, my face faces painfully outwards, overexposing its north-lit bits. Here there is only one room to hide in, one secret space in which to sit, and this, this gash of a poem, this is it. Thank you. So the next poem comes from the second part of the book, which is called Suburban Fantasy. So it's sort of um, exploring women's roles and as wives and mothers and so forth. The first poem is called Plot, and it's a bit of a remix, well, it is a remix of Philip Larkin's The Whitson Wedding. So that incredible poem, you know, most of us would know where he's the poet sitting on the train going down to London and um, he sees all the newly married couples jumping on about to start, about to start their life. And he ends the poem with this fabulous image. They're swelled a sense of falling like an arrow shower sent out of sight somewhere becoming rain. So that real sense of fecundity and potential, you know, their lives about to start. But I began to think about this, you know, I love Larkin's poetry, but apparently he was a bit of a, you know, not, not the most pleasant dude necessarily, a <laughs> bit of a misanthrope, but um, he, he, I was thinking he probably didn't know much about how it was for women. That would have been the 40s or 50s, you know, and, and what was their life going to be like? What was their potential? So I remixed, um, remixed wits and weddings very um, boldly I think um, taking words here and there and creating um, a conversation with luck and um, talking about what that may have looked like for women plot all afternoon the women shared their wounding loosed from fathers free of knots under their belts the secret smut a hothouse lark the race to wed time gripping tighter Along the line, children define the marked off landscape of their lives. Marriage struck, then swelled, then slowed, the girl displaced inside. A blinding sense of nondescript, bright parodies of dull success, their aims like arrows falling out of sight as if they died. And not one flashed uniquely, and nothing fresh survived. The last poem I'm going to read is called uh, Incarnate, and it's in uh, it's a poem I wrote for um, my late friend Ramon Liola. So some of you may know his work or may have known him. He was a poet um, who died in 2018. Um, he had a 
he had a brain aneurysm. He was only 52. He died really suddenly. And he was a beautiful, beautiful soul. And when he passed away, his family, he had a lovely library you know, of books. He was such a great reader and supporter of other writers. His family opened up his you know, private library and said you know, to his friends to come and, take, um, come and take a book in memory of him. So I went and took a book um, which was Four Reincarnations by Max Ritvo. So um, Max Ritvo was an American poet. He also died you know, he quite young, 26, I think, of cancer. And so I began to think about um, the way poets, even though we do pass on, we're still in conversation with each other. And the way I was getting this book from a poet who'd passed, um, from my friend who had passed, and the way we all, um, yeah, we, we remain in conversation and we build upon each other's work and thoughts and we take solace um, from each other. So this is In Memoriam Raymond Leola Incarnate. I'm reading Four Reincarnations by Max Ritvo, the book An Unintentional Bequest by my friend, the poet Ramon Leola. Unlike Max, Ramon was evicted by his body from life suddenly, unexpectedly. He left like you leave your home every morning, intending to return. Stepping out, his soul shared all but what barely exists, leaving behind just those earthly accruements which others might find useful. A library illuminated with notes and creased corners. His own poems lodged like touchstones in our minds. The sacred relics of his recycled organs, all circling out there in the world of others. A generosity of thought and flesh reverberating through space-time. A papery vein burst in Ramon's brain and out tumbled his full bounty of jewels. Each orb a revelation of pomegranate seed quickening on our tongues. We come as supplicants, scavengers, curators to feast on his cryptic freeze. And now, within the fragile bubble of my own body-mind, as I divine Max Ritvo by Ramon Liola, I glimpse both poets coil, like silver koi linked head to tail, in the glistening chain mail of my poem. Thank you so much. Thank you. 